So yeah, you heard the title of my talk. I just want to mention my collaborators are listed here. Um, I won't name them all. Um, and I will tell you something about, um, about reconnection uh, in relation to the, uh, well, recent to, to, to last year's uh, EHT observations. Um, so I, I assume you've all seen this image. Uh, the Event Horizon Telescope captured the accreting plasma um, around the M87 black hole. Um, and you can simulate this with uh, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. Um, we know that, uh, that this, this plasma lives in a strong gravitational and electromagnetic field. Um, so we need a combination of Maxwell's equations and fluid dynamics uh, in a general relativistic framework. Um, and we know from, from the observations that the, the macroscopic scale of, of, the, um, of, say, the event horizon is larger than, say, 10 to the 8 kilometers, just to give you an idea. And the plasma consists of, uh, of, of charged particles. And for example, the electrons and the positrons have a typical microscopic scale of about a kilometer um, order of magnitude. They're, they're, and then I'm talking about their gyration radius. Um, this, this means in general that the mean free path of those particles is, is about 10 to the eight uh, Schwarzschild radii. And it means that this plasma is collisionless. So, um, so the particles in general don't undergo collisions. Uh, they're too sparse. And it means that they can accelerate to, to non-thermal velocities, like they can accelerate out of the typical Maxwellian distribution. Um, but the magnetohydrodynamics framework treats the plasma as a, as a fluid, and this fluid is not collisionless. So we're actually uh, unaware of what the, what the electrodynamics uh, do and how they affect the radiation that we, that we observe. Um, so this gives the main uncertainty in interpreting the, the, the image of the, of the EHT, and usually this is, uh, this is only uh, done in post-processing, um, and, and, and uh, we sort of guess what the electrodynamics, um, electron dynamics are. Um, another example is uh, the, the flares that, are, that have been observed from Sagittarius A star in the center of our own galaxy uh, by over many, many years, but most recently by the gravity collaboration who, who observed um, a hotspot that moved in, uh, that, that, that orbited in, within the, uh, the inner 10 uh, Schwarz Schwarzschild radii. Um, and uh, the conjecture was that, that such a hotspot was formed due to magnetic reconnection. And we know from plasma experiments that uh, in reconnection, we, we, uh, we get plasmoids and in those plasmoids, um, we know that electrons can get accelerated and those electrons have to be accelerated to Lorentz factors of 10 to the 6 to, to explain the observations. Um, they emit non-thermal radiation in the, in the infrared and the x-ray. And, and we know we can estimate that their uh, gyro radius is again 10 to the minus 11 Schwarzschild radii, uh, while the emission region, the hotspot, is about one or a few uh, Schwarzschild radii. So again, here you have an extreme scale separation and you would need kinetic theory to describe the microphysics and magnetohydrodynamics to describe the global dynamics of the accretion proof. Now, what is relativistic magnetic reconnection that we think can explain these kind of flares? Um, if we have a very simple setup of anti-parallel magnetic field lines, uh, in between the field lines, you have a magnetic null or a current sheet and uh, magnetic energy can dissipate through a, a resistivity, um, and that's what we call reconnection. So if we have a highly magnetized plasma, it means that there is a lot of magnetic energy to be dissipated into kinetic or thermal energy, and we get a relativistic exhaust from the current sheet. Looks something like this here on the left, where you see anti-parallel field lines. The inflow into the, into the current sheet is generally uh, well described with uh, ideal uh, magnetohydrodynamics or even force-free, like the, it's um, uh, infinite, infinitely magnetized limit. Um, there is a resistive region where the reconnection happens and, and uh, in, uh, in the very middle of the reconnection layer, um, we really need to know the particle dynamics to fully understand what's going on. So this is really a multi-scale problem um, even if, if it's unrelated to the accretion disk of, uh, of a black hole. In a, in a local box, we can, we can solve this problem with kinetic simulation. So we really simulate the electrons and the positrons or the electrons and the ions, and we know exactly what, what's going on. So if we do that, we see that in such a current sheet, um, you see here a current, current density, uh, you see that, uh, that, that the current sheet, it, it tears, it breaks up into these, into these tiny blobs, which we call plasmoids. Those plasmoids, they can um, grow and go. They, they, they move, they affect with the flow. 
and they can merge with each other into into larger um, larger plasmoids uh, that are um, that have a high temperature. So there you could call them hotspots. Um, and this is an endless process because in between merging plasmoids, you get a new current sheet that again becomes plasmoid unstable. Um, so the question is, can we model this uh, in, a, in, in, in a global setting uh, with, with the magnetohydrodynamics? Um, because a, a kinetic simulation is too expensive to do on a global scale and to capture the, the full accretion dynamics and the jet uh, physics. Um, if we assume that such a reconnection layer lives around a black hole, uh, it would look something like this. Um, here is a, a sketch of how it would form plasmoids. Uh, and if we model this in, in, in uh, magnetohydrodynamics, we need a small resistivity that, that makes the, um, the field reconnect. Uh, that resistivity can either be numerical in, in ideal MHD, but then you sort of rely on, on, on numerical errors for your reconnection to occur, or it can be explicit um, and you can, uh, you can use it to model the, the physics. Um, the second thing is what we did. And if you, if you plug that into, um, into a code, then, uh, then you see that also with magnetohydrodynamics, you, you get a current sheet that becomes plasmoid unstable and it looks a lot like uh, what I showed you before in the, in the kinetic simulation. Um, this specifically happens for Lundquist numbers or magnetic Reynolds numbers, which, um, uh, which uh, describe the, uh, the, the importance of this resistivity that are higher than 10 to the, 10 to the four. This means that your resistivity has to be very small um, for a connection to occur in this plasmoid dominated regime. And it means that the scales that you have to resolve are very small and very fast, which, which obviously makes it, makes it difficult. So can we do this in a global accretion disk model? Here you see two examples on the, on the right. On the right, you see one example where the resistivity is uh, 10 to the minus 14, which is extremely small. So it's completely unresolved on the, on the grid that I'm using. On the left, you see a resistivity of 10 to the minus two that is fully resolved. So on the right, you see that the magnetorotational instability kicks in and it develops turbulence in the disk as we all, uh, as, we, as we know from ideal MHD simulations, uh, for example, in the EHT um, done by the EHT community. A jet is launched through the blandford nyack mechanism. Um, however, if the resistivity is too high, this all doesn't happen. The turbulence cannot develop. The MRI is quenched and no powerful jet is launched. Um, but the good news is that a small resistivity, even if unresolved here, it, it retrieves the global ideal MHD results that we, we sort of know are, are globally correct. So what we want is to, to do resistive GRMHD with a small yet resolved resistivity that describes globally the accretion physics that we know and on a smaller scale describes the reconnection that we expect uh, forms these kind of uh, flares or hotspots. In a turbulent flow, uh, you, you can see if this, if this works. Um, and, and, and here I, I, uh, I just evolve a, a vortex, a, a simple vortex. And, uh, and you see here that also current sheet forms um, here and it, it's plasmoid unstable. If you look at the current density, you see it even better. And this was for a Lundquist number of 20,000. So it was well in the, in the plasmoid dominated regime. But if then you, if you look at the evolution of the magnetic energy density, so the energy that's supposed to dissipate through reconnection and power the flare, you see that you need resolutions of at least about 8,000 squared or order of magnitude 10,000 squared cells to resolve this properly. You see that the cyan line here is, 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 is um, under resolving the magnetic energy density evolution. So, so you really need very high resolution. Um, and to obtain that, we use adaptive mesh refinement. Now, I don't know if you can see the lines here uh, in the plot on the right, but there are very, very tiny cells here in the current sheet, um, which resolve the reconnection physics very well. And here in the ambient regions outside the current sheet, the cells are a lot larger and, uh, and, uh, and that makes the simulation less expensive. So if we apply the same mechanism for a global simulation, we can resolve a small resistivity of, of uh, five times 10 to the minus five, um, which gives you a, a Lundquist number of 10 to the five. So we're well into the plasmoid dominated regime. We use six, six levels of, uh, of mesh refinement, giving us an effective resolution of 12,000 by 6,000 cells approximately. And it means that the current sheets that we, we see will be captured by, by more than 10 cells over their widths. So, so it's really well resolved. And um, this gives you a convergence uh, of the plasmoid formation process. So if we zoom in, we see the different levels and we see that the disk is actually very well resolved by the, by the highest two levels. 
And if we're close to the black hole, we see these type of current sheets, which actually look a lot like the Harris sheets um, uh, that, that, that we model in, in the local box uh, simulation. Um, if we zoom in further, we see that even uh, mergers of plasmoids are resolved. And, and here you see secondary current sheets. Um, so how does this look like in a video? I will speed this video up a little bit because um, we first have to reach a steady state accretion. Uh, on the left, you see the, the density and the temperature, and on the right, you see the plasma beta. And um, a, a high plasma beta or a low inverse plasma beta, as I'm plotting, indicates a current sheet. So you see here a wiggling current sheet that, that is in the equatorial plane. And at some point, it becomes plasmoid unstable, like you see here, and there is a second one. And those plasmoids, so the little blobs that you see here, they can either fall into the black hole uh, when they're too close, or they can be, uh, they can be um, ejected or they can escape. When they escape, they either go into the accretion disk or they escape along the jet sheath. Um, uh, so, so the jet sheath is the, the, uh, the, the red to blue um, region here. Uh, and they heat up this, uh, this jet sheath uh, by, 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 by a lot. So the temperature here is highly relativistic. This is the dimensionless temperature. Um, and, and, and the temperature of one, uh, in the, higher than one, indicates that this plasma is highly relativistic. So if you look at this video in a bit more detail, we see that, that indeed there is, uh, for example, here a, plasma, uh, a plasmoid chain forming uh, and the plasmoids that, uh, that can escape uh, towards, uh, like di diagonally uh, up, they form a very big plasmoid here or a monster plasmoid or a hotspot. And that uh, monster plasmoid can, uh, can orbit and at some point it gets expelled. And that looks a lot like what, gravity, uh, uh, what the gravity interferometer observed, which you see here on the right, um, and you see that this, uh, this hotspot that they observed uh, orbits for about one period um, and it, uh, it, it's within the inner 10 uh, Schwarzschild radii. And that's exactly where this hotspot here um, lives. Uh, this results in a, in a flare and, 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 uh, and, and um, a flare here is, uh, is, is indicated by this blue and red line uh, where we have a, a, a peak in the intensity. I'll get back to that later. So what happens here physically is that you have an infalling flux tube here on the left. It becomes plasmoid unstable and you see these little blobs. The little blobs can, can escape and bump into each other forming a larger blob and this larger blob here escapes uh, along the jet uh, sheath. The plasmoids form within the ten, inner 10 uh, Schwarzschild radii as, as gravity observed and they have a lifetime of about 100 um, Schwarzschild radii over the speed of light which in Sagittarius A star time is about 30 to 40 minutes. The maximum size of these plasmoids is, is, uh, is one or two uh, Schwarzschild radii, um, which actually confirms uh, the, the magnetohydrodynamics reconnection rate of 0 0.01 uh, times the speed of light. So how to connect this to the, to the flares? Um, you see here a plot of the, of the temperature again, and you see that the plasmoids indeed, um, if they can escape, they, they, they heat the jet uh, limb, um, and uh, if, if, you, if you calculate the, the actual temperature um, that, that this dimensionless number corresponds to, then in the flare state, which is indicated here with the red and the blue lines, is about 10 to the five times higher than in quiescence. And quiescence is indicated by the black line. And so we see that from 10 to the 10 Kelvin in quiescence, we can reach temperatures of 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 uh, during, the, during the flare. In the magnetic field, uh, we, see, we see the opposite. We see that uh, in quiescence, the field um, just follows a one, one over R dependence, again, indicated by the black line. And during the flare, we see that, uh, that the field drops from, from, say, between 10 and 50 uh, Gauss to uh, a few Gauss, one, two, three uh, Gauss, approximately. Um, so the blue line indicates the first flare, and the red line indicates the second flare. They happen in the same simulation. Um, they last about 30 to 60 minutes, and uh, in between the flares, um, there, there is about 100, 100 minutes. Um, I have to say this only happens in magnetically arrested disks. Uh, I, I don't want to get further into this point, but what's important is that there is a very high magnetization in such disks that can power these flares. If in, in a standard disk where, there is, um, where the magnetization is lower, you sort, you sort of don't get a flare, uh, but there is also no quiescence. The, 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 there is just no distinction between the states. So plasmoids can form, but there is no clear flaring state in, in, in that case. I showed you axisymmetric simulations, and of course, actually... Uh, 
of course, actually, you want to know uh, what happens in, a, in, in, in real life in a 3D simulation. Um, so we can do this in 3D, uh, but we need extreme resolution. So it is very expensive. But these 3D simulations, they can give us information about the azimuthal motion of the hotspots and also about their interaction with non-axisymmetric instabilities like Kelvin Helmholtz or Rayleigh Taylor. Um, and the question is, do plasmoid unstable current sheets still form? Well, here you see a, a thousand cube simulation with the hammer code. Uh, and you see that there is a, a current sheet indicated by the high plasma beta here again of about three uh, Schwarzschild radii. Um, and you see hints of plasmoids here. Um, you have to look very carefully. There are little blobs in the current sheet, so they're not fully resolved here yet. But just to give you an idea, you need a resolution that's 10 times 10 times 10 larger than the standard EHT simulation. So this is only possible with a GPU accelerated hammer code. Um, and we were able to run a 1,024 cubed, uh, cubed run, and it gives us very similar results to uh, um, like our axisymmetric results, which is very promising. Uh, and we hope, of course, that we can do higher resolution and, and fully resolve the plasmoids in 3D. That was, uh, that was everything I had to tell. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Bart. Um, uh, so we have uh, a couple of questions here from um, uh, Daniel Wang. Uh, the first one is that the reconnection, and I think you discussed this a little bit, the, the reconnection leads to the heating of the plasma. Um, what determines the temperature of the plasma by reconnection, and what is the relative energy partition between the cosmic ray and thermal energies? Um, the, the temperature is determined by the reconnection process and specifically by the, the magnetic energy density that's available in the, in, in the bulk plasma that, that powers the reconnection. Um, and in a magnetically arrested disk, this magnetic energy density is typically much higher, like 10 times higher than the standard, which means that also your temperature can be 10 times higher through this reconnection process. The, the typical temperature of the Plasmoid. I don't know if, if these are cosmic rays, but the typical temperature of the hotspots is, is about five orders of magnitude uh, higher than the accretion disk in quiescence. Great. Um, and so Daniel's other question is, um, and I, I have a related one to this, which is, uh, can you give a time scale for the clustering among flares of Sag A star? And related to that, um, are there temporal or also um, uh, just uh, luminosity measurements of the observed flares in Sag A star that um, are or are not consistent with, say, the, the time scales and the energetics that you expect from uh, this uh, particular model. Right. So the time scales in our simulations are completely determined, again, by the reconnection physics, whereas before people thought it was mainly determined by the, by the orbit of, of the black hole. So that was quite surprising. Um, and the, the, the time of the, the, the lifetime of the hotspots, which corresponds sort of to the lifetime of the flare, um, uh, is in accordance with what was measured by gravity and by other flare observations. However, the, the timing in between the flares uh, that I see is too short. And I think this is because of the 2D nature of my simulations. Mm -hmm. I expect that there are less plasmoids and less hotspots in 3D um, which they will live for the same amount of time, but, but there will be a larger um, time in between their formation. So, so that's all I can say. 